Now to the Central African Republic, a nation consumed by violence, hatred and instability. In this largely forgotten crisis, restoring peace seems an almost impossible task, but that's what UN peacekeepers are striving to do. Here's our story. Les souvenirs que moi j'ai, c'est surtout de voir nos frères qui sont tués comme des bêtes. Leur cœur était gorgé de haine, qui se sont levés et qui coupaient leurs semblables avec des couteaux, avec des matières. Personne ne pouvait entendre la voix de la raison. C'est comme s'ils se nourrissent de la violence. On marche dans le sang pour arriver au pouvoir. Il y a une telle pauvreté et une telle misère aujourd'hui tout est prétexte à crise, tout est prétexte à règlement de compte, tout est prétexte à vengeance. Since the end of 2012, the Central African Republic, a small and very poor landlocked country of 4.5 million, has been convulsed by civil war and sectarian violence. A struggle over political power, land and resources now sees mainly Christian militia groups known as anti-Balaka pitted against a mostly Muslim militia known as ex Selica. The government has very limited influence beyond the capital. Effectively, much of the country has been divided up into lawless fiefdoms controlled by local militias, with criminality driving much of the violence rather than religion. For many, the only protection comes from the United Nations. UN and other international peacekeepers were deployed after the current crisis erupted. Watching our report with me is Ian Martin, who's head of the influential publication Security Council Report. Ian also used to head UN missions in East Timor, Nepal and in Libya. Ian, we'll talk about Central African Republic in a moment, but let's talk about the whole of the peacekeeping system, because there's a record number of peacekeepers right now, over 120,000. Is the system coping or is it creaking? It's certainly facing unprecedented challenges, and that's true not only in the sense that there are multiple crises, which is reflected in those numbers, but it's also true in terms of the complexity and the difficulty of the situations into which peace operations are now deploying. Uh, peacekeeping started off classically in uh, maintaining ceasefires, maintaining a, a line of control between formerly warring parties. It went on to support the implementation of peace agreements when they'd been negotiated, usually between two parties, uh, one government, one rebel uh, faction. Uh, but now the contexts in which peace operations are operating are much more messy than, than that. Uh, and they also pose increasing security challenges to United Nations personnel as well as to the civilians caught up in those situations. So tell me a little bit more about the complexities of some of the current peacekeeping operations. Well, if we take uh, Mali, for example, it's a situation that is also deeply penetrated by Al-Qaeda, by violent extremists uh, committing uh, acts of terrorism. Uh, it means that peacekeepers are facing what are called asymmetric threats, uh, which has resulted in uh, extremely high levels of casualties, deaths and injuries amongst peacekeepers deployed in, in northern Mali. And I think there's pretty general agreement that, that UN Blue Helmet forces are not suitable to do counter-terrorism. But nonetheless, peacekeepers are in a context where they're subject to terrorist attacks, so one can't draw a simple line between a counter-terrorism operation uh, and trying to maintain a peace in a context where, where there's a serious terrorist threat. Let's look at the Central African Republic in that report. Now that's a place where UN peacekeepers were sent to protect people. Mm. And instead there have been some hideous allegations of sexual abuse by uh, UN peacekeepers. How do you change the system to stop this sort of thing happening? Yes, that's quite right. The United Nations has not done enough to prevent and Perhaps the most inform important form of prevention is the swiftest possible investigation and punishment of those found to be responsible for, for sexual exploitation and, and abuse. Uh, a number of reports are, are, are pressing in that direction and the Secretary General is acting upon that. 
Having said that, I think we should also say that the troops deployed to the Central African Republic have undoubtedly saved the lives of a lot of civilians. So I don't think anybody should think that it was not important for there to be a deployment into the Central African Republic when there were terrible massacres uh, taking place. Uh, but in no way is that any kind of an excuse for some of the crime. We've talked about the Central African Republic, we've talked about Mali, the two most recent peacekeeping missions. Is the UN doing enough to try and prevent conflict and looking at early warning systems to try and see where there, where there are problems ahead? The UN is certainly doing a lot uh, and its efforts are effective in some conflict prevention and of course one doesn't hear about successes in conflict prevention. But I think it's also not doing enough and I think the Security Council isn't ready to uh, apply its political pressures early enough. There are still strong national sovereignty concerns, countries don't like being talked about early on as the crisis grows. There are appalling conflicts where there are no peacekeepers. First of all, Syria, where so many people have died, but also Iraq, Yemen, Libya, where you used to be based. Do you think if there was more unity on the Security Council, there'd be more success in stopping these conflicts? Certainly, they require unity in the Security Council, and, and that's obviously been a major problem in the case of, of, of Syria. And, and not only in the Security Council, they also require a genuine common effort by regional countries that have a lot of influence. The, the current conflict in South Sudan and certainly the conflict in, in Libya is made more complex if countries in the region support one side or another rather than give united support to the efforts of the United Nations or whoever is mediating the conflict to bring about a, a peaceful power sharing outcome. 70 years on, let's look at the wider picture. Is the UN, given the problems we've seen with peacekeeping and whatever, is it still the right model for dealing with conflict around the world? I don't think there's any alternative to a fully multilateral framework. Um, it's very important that the UN works with regional organisations. Uh, it's important that powerful countries, those who have power internationally or in their regions, uh, take efforts to resolve conflict. But ultimately, one requires the degree of impartiality and common effort that I think only the United Nations can bring. In Martin, we'll have to leave it there. Thanks very much for joining us.